Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, hey, welcome to Super Agents Live. Thanks for tuning in. I know your time is super valuable, so I am really appreciative you come and spend some with me. Hey, look, today on the show, man, I've been having all the big trainers in the real estate world come on. We've had Mike Ferry, we've had Tom Ford, we've had Bob Corcoran. Today's guy is a guy that... uh, He's actually got a really big, big platform. I didn't know how big this guy was until um, we actually started talking. So his name is Tim Harris. If you don't know who Tim is, you should go and, uh, and look him up. Um, today is kind of a first, right? So our show runs long. It always runs long. You know, it's always, I, you know, in my, in my pre, uh, my music, I'm like, hey, for the next 30 minutes, you're going to spend time with... It's never 30 minutes. I feel like I feel like actually it takes me you know 15 to 20 minutes to really break into that person and and get them going. And most of the time the ends of our my episodes, my interviews are are that's where the fire's at, man. We might get some meat in the beginning, but the fire, you know, that's when I can wrangle them up. So, today is part 1 of a two-part session. Tim and I spend two hours on the phone and look at the end of our first hour i was like dude we gotta wrap it up i know there's more and he's like let's go part two part two and i'm like let's do it so that's what we did all right so uh before we get to it if you're new hashtag for the show it's our hashtag we own it unpack that idea you know if you listen to the show i say it all the time like look unpack that for me i don't let people get away with just telling me something i'm like unpack it i make them like break it down and find out what's meaningful for you so if you you use that if you tweet that hashtag out it's a big follow train you'll get new followers i'll follow you and and seriously people have gotten uh i talked to one girl and she said uh, i i use the hashtag and i got she added like 300 followers so we have a very uh active tribe on Twitter. Uh, so I'd love to see you there. All right. Hey, let's get to part one. Tim Harris on the show today. Today's guest is a coach that many of you in the audience has recommended to me. I've heard consistently that this guy's authentic and a real time coach, whatever that means. He's come up on my radar over and over and I knew I had to get him on the show. I am thrilled to welcome Tim Harris of Tim and Julie Harris.com. Hey, Tim, thanks for taking the time out today. Hey, Toby, I've been looking forward to this, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We are, man. Hey, so you and I, we've had a few offline conversations, um, and uh, again, that's another reason why I knew I had to get you on the show. Take a minute. You have an interesting background, an interesting, rich career. Take a minute. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, then what you do. Well, I mean, Julie and I have been in the real estate industry our entire adult lives, basically, We've been married this year for 23 years. I only mention that because almost all 23 of those years we've been in the real estate industry. We bought our first house while we were still in college, and from that experience, we sort of had the epiphany, well, that didn't seem like a lot of work, and, you know, so we thought, well, let's not worry about pursuing our ambitions of, you know, being English majors, and we finished up with college, and we, you know, got right into the real estate business, and our first year in the business and if I'm being honest, it was not by design. It was basically almost on accident. We sold over 100 houses. It was 103 houses. Now, this was back in our early 20s. This was in Columbus, Ohio. We didn't list a subdivision, or we didn't somehow get lucky and you know, work with some investor that gave us a million transactions. This was one unit after another. This is one, you know, one home buyer, one home seller after another. Uh, and it was like August or September. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> August or September. Julie and I were literally sitting outside of a movie theater in Dublin, Ohio, and we started adding up on like the back of a napkin, trying to remember how many houses we sold. And we came up with a number of like, I don't remember, it was 75 or something. And we called our broker. It was at night. R- Rory Averill of Remax North, fantastic broker. If you guys are in Columbus, Ohio, and you're looking for a brokerage, I cannot recommend Rory any more than, you know, I, I, I just he's fantastic. And by the way, he's fantastic because his, his management style is leave you alone, let you learn from your own mistakes, and you know, win your own successes. So we call up Rory and we say, hey, Rory, 
you know, what is expected for the average agent to sell per year? And we had no idea. You know, we kept our heads down. We hadn't been hanging out with other agents. We hadn't been going to conferences. We hadn't been doing anything. We'd just basically been, you know, one sale at a time, working our way through. So he asked us, the conversation was very brief. He goes, how many houses have you sold so far? And I think we said 75 or whatever the number was. He goes, call me back when you get to 100. Then he just hung up on us. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah, but it was awesome, though, because we didn't know 75 was good or 100 was great. We didn't know any of those things. So he said, okay, we went and watched our movie, and then, you know, we, we clipped to 100, and then word started, you know, creeping out that what we had done, just different things. And one thing led to another, led to another, and then we were, you know, Howard Brenton Stars, National Association of Realtors, has over the years they did two you know really nice stories on us we did a speaking tour back and after this happened we wrote a book called zero to ten million in one year we did all these other types of things uh after that and really by accident people started asking us now this was back in the 90s agents started asking us will you it was called shadowing then this was even before there was real formalized coaching so you know will can you can we shadow you so they come out and spend the day with us and then one day we were Howard Brenton stars. And we were at this Howard Brenton event, and Howard was up on stage announcing his new, you know, God rest his soul. He was announcing his new coaching program. Julie and I were in the back of the room, you know, wearing our. Any of you guys who know about Howard Brenton stars, we always the stars always wore black polo shirts. So we're in the back of the room and are sweating our butts off in our black polo shirts. And uh, I remember Howard said, "I'm doing this coaching program. It's going to be this and it's going to be that." And those of you who are interested, I'm about to take a break. Come up and give me your business card. But I remember. The audience was maybe 1,500 people. Like 1,500 people just mobbed Howard on stage. <laughs> this, is, this is Howard saying he wanted to take on like 20 or 30 personal clients. He got mobbed. Well, at that event, people started approaching agents. The attendees started approaching Julie and I asking us, will you guys consider uh, coaching me? And I thought, well, okay, we'll give it a try. And then quickly, um, now this was probably about 98, I'm guessing, 98, 99, that business to no fault of our own, just basically took off, honestly. And it's, it's almost, it was almost an accident because we didn't really think, we didn't really have the thought, well, let's be real estate coaches. It just sort of happened organically and, and blossomed from there. That's really how it happened. There's no real incredible you know, story behind it. It was basically by accident. But since then, we were able to grow it and mature it, and, and uh, you know, we've had thousands and thousands of realtors as coaching students. Yeah, no, you, so let's, that's interesting. So number one, when you were selling real estate, uh, you had no frame of reference whether 75 was good or not. Um, I, although you were very deliberate in going out and selling that 75, um, what, what are some of the things, I mean, what, what made you, how did you guys do that? Well, I think really what you're asking is what was our motivation, right? Um, yeah, we can talk about motivation, but really I'm talking about mechanically because, you know, again, I see this very deliberate thing on this side, right? Selling the 75 houses. Okay. You know, I, I'm sorry. I understand your question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, the number one thing was really kick-ass lead follow-up, honestly. Got it. That was the main thing. Lead follow-up, we started using an IVR service called uh, 1-800-HOME-HOTLINE.COM. We started, you know, basically we started forming the real estate system now that we use, other, that we coach other agents to. But we were able to identify well, we made a list of Toby was all the things that basically come up in a listing presentation or prior to the listing presentation that were kind of, you know, stress events, right? So a seller will ask you, why should I list my house with you? The seller will ask, cut your commission. The seller will ask all these types of questions. And so we write all, wrote all these things down. And then what we did is uh, really at, at that point, you know, through getting to know people around the country who are always also top producers because Remax had flown us out to Colorado and you know, we did this speaking thing at RSN and from, uh, from back when RSN was around. And anyway, we started uh, meeting all these other top producers, and we saw how they did their businesses. And we started essentially employing some of their best practices idea, and we brought those back to Columbus. So we were able to basically offer our marketplace, uh, the sellers specifically in our marketplace, um, USPs, which stands for Unique Selling Propositions, which is, you know, a term from Ross or Reeves. We started offering those in such a way that we were very compelling. So I think what we did, number one, is great lead follow-up. Number two, we were offering something unique to the marketplace, as we still are in our coaching business, ironically. Um, and number three, honestly, Julie and I, back then and still now, are just hard workers. We just really are very focused on goals, very focused on really enjoying life. And really, to enjoy life, you have to have money. <laughs> but the, the irony of it, the, the bottom line was, back then, when our first year in the business, 
We were just trying to pay off our student loans. And we had, you know, $30,000 in student loans. I'd gone to Ashland, Otterbein, and Ohio State, and, you know, we just wanted to pay off our student loans. So we, we earned hundreds of thousands of dollars our first year in the business, and we had the money, obviously, to pay off our student loans. True story. We go to our back, in the backyard. I get some wire fluid. <laughs> I threw a batch on the student loan books, and the things wouldn't burn. That's the truth. <laughs> They're coated with some kind of paper that was supposed to prevent them from burning. But anyway. That's weird. So that was, an, it was, it was, a, motiva- it was a combination of hard work, yeah. offering something unique to the marketplace, great lead follow-up, and really a burning desire to make something really great of ourselves. And we knew we could do it. Yeah, that's uh, – yeah, I mean, I mean, f- reaching your own potential. But look, at the end of the day, right, it's that hustle. And that is a thing – you and I talked offline. And, and it, when, it, when it comes to selling real estate, there's really nothing new, right? I mean, all, it, it comes down to really kind of the same kind of basic things in a lot of ways. It's the hustle that you can't teach people. Um, you, throughout your career in coaching people, it, 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 how do you ad- – well, tell- Toby, I think you can teach people that, to okay. be honest with you. Okay. You have to basically, and I'll tell you, it's something, you just touched on something that is a real hallmark of um, a really awesome topic, and I'll, I'll kind of go through it quick for the sake of time. Many agents don't want to be perceived as being salespeople. I went through this back when Julie and I were in her early 20s. I totally get it. You know, you're worried that if you're overly, you know, the words that agents use when, I don't want to seem overly aggressive, or I don't want to seem all these sort of negative, you know, descriptors. But the reality of it is, it's just the opposite of what we think. So you can teach someone to hustle. For example, you make your own lead follow-up rules. And one of the things we teach our coaching students, for example, it was when you get a lead in from, say, 1-800-HOME-HOTLINE or any kind of lead, you follow up with them immediately, right? You know, the exception being is if, with, if you're another, with another client. But that immediate lead follow-up, Toby, makes all the difference. And if you don't mind, I can take you through a real quick script that yeah. agents seem to really – okay. Love it. All right, so 800 Home Hotline. You guys got to check it out. The way it works, basically, is IVR technology has been around since the 70s. The gist is anytime you call an 800 number, um, you know, you, any kind of toll-free number where the owner of the number is paying for your call, you can't block your number. So this IVR technology works around the premise that – you know, you have a writer on your sign, and the sign writer says, for free 24-hour record info on this house, call, you know, and whatever your unique 800 number is, and whatever the unique extension is for that particular house. This technology has been around forever. It's not new. It's what happens afterwards that's really the secret sauce. So someone's parked in front of your for sale sign. Someone calls the 800 number, a buyer, right? Yeah. Um, they're interested in the property. It's a new listing. So you call them back right away, and by right away, so you get the SMS, it tells you what phone number that they're calling from, and it tells you what extension they just dialed. You then, as the agent, pick up your cell phone, and you call them right back, and this is what you say. I'm going to run it both ways for the sake of time, so I'm going to role play with myself, if you will. Sure. So ring, ring, hello. Hi, this is Tim Harris with ABC Realty. As a courtesy, when people call our 800 number, I like to give them a quick call back to see if there are any uh, questions about the home they called about. Now, in the descriptor, when they called and listened, you'd give them the broad strokes of it. You haven't given them the price, but you gave them a price range. So, you know, 300 to, say, 330 would be the low 300s. 330 to 360 would be mid 300s because you have had to have done a very brief audio recording on this house. That's what they heard when they hit the extension. Right. So they'll say, well, yes, is the house currently available or what's the asking price or whatever the question they might still have. And you say, you know, excellent. Let me check to make sure the property is still available Mm. and confirm the current offering price. Remember, you can run these ads, these types of ads I'm talking about. I was talking about putting this on a sign writer, but you could also do this on an actual ad. You know, you could lace this 800 number to your actual ad. So um, they'll say, well, what's the current price? And you say, well, that's a great house. Let me check to make sure it's still available and find out the current price. Then you say, here's the secret sauce part, Toby. Okay. Um, by the way, which house in the neighborhood are you thinking about selling? Mm. Now, Right? So most agents, what they're going to do is they're going to try to form this sort of artificial relationship, and they're going to try to basically feed this information about the house, and hopefully the buyer lead likes them, and maybe, you know, all these other types. No, get it out of the way right away. By the way, which house in the neighborhood are you thinking about selling? Now, if your listeners were to use the system like I just described and not change it, every single one of them will take more listings than they possibly can imagine, because here's a statistical fact. When you, call, like when you put the 800 home hotline rider on your sign, you put the sign in the yard, it's a new listing, virtually all the initial calls for the first two or three days will be the neighbors calling about the price. 
right. the neighbors who are thinking about selling. Nobody casually calls and checks about a price on a property. They're calling because they want to know the price. So when you call them right back, use the script you know, as a courtesy, and then you go right to the question, by the way, which house, you will get listing leads. You know, how many? You get 10 calls in the IVR, probably realistically when the first two or three days, 30 to 40% are going to be potential sellers sometime in the next 90 to 120 days. Otherwise, they wouldn't be calling. So why am I talking about this? You can teach an agent to be frosty, you know, have that aggressive spirit. If you explain to them um, why, just to tell an agent, just to assume that there's this magical, mystical 1% that some people have and some people don't, and you can't coach people to that 1%, that's just not true. Everybody has it in them to be great. Some people just need a little bit more explanation as to the how, the whys, and what to say, and how to say it. Once they have that, honestly, Toby, it doesn't matter who they are. It could be somebody that basically has been sitting behind a computer all their life and has never sold anything, or it could be somebody who's a phenomenal salesperson. Everyone can be, if they understand the background behind it, told what to say and how to say it, and they can get the same result. That right. is the truth. Interesting. So, uh, so that's, that's, that, that, is a, that, that strategy, that method is pretty interesting. So number one, you know, in terms of this, this 800 hotline rider, this little thing on top of the sign, I rarely see that. Well, I mean, you rarely see agents that are making more than $29,450 <laughs> a year either. Right. Oh, no, I mean, right? right? I mean, that's right. the average. But that's, and you're in San Diego, right? I'm in Austin, Texas. Yeah. The average agent in the United States earns less than $30,000 a year. The top producers right now are saying, Tim, shut up. I don't want my competition knowing about what you're telling them. Yeah. So, so right. Well, my point is, my point is, you know, that's a simple strategy that, that, that p- sh- people should employ and it's not right. It's a simple thing to just, Hey, just go right. ahead and put this right around. So the it's, other it's thing, 30, Toby, it's $37 a month too. That's the crazy. That's part. crazy. That's nuts. So, so one thing I wanted to briefly talk about is in that script, one of the things you said, you kind of like we're building in scarcity around the house, right? You said, Hey, hold on. Let me sure. see if it's still available. And I don't know, right. If, right? So you're building scarcity, you know, because you know, again, if uh, for me, if I like a house, and you know, they say uh, it may not be available, I'm like, crap, man. You know, may, like I better write an offer right now. <clears throat> the the other thing, this this is really what I'm talking about. So, thirty to forty percent. Uh, uh, what was that? Thirty. You're going to get in terms of listing leads. 30, 40, 30 to forty percent of the people call you. You're going to get as listing leads. Is that what you said? Let's drill down on that. So you have to, in your mind, everyone listening, you have to understand that nobody is going to call about one of your houses for sale ever unless they have it in their minds as a dominant thought that they either want to buy or sell a home. So forget in a race, a race, a race forever that there's ever anything such as a non-motivated lead. Nobody is going to take the time of their busy lives between their Twittering and their Facebook updating and their whatever the heck else they're doing, going to the beach in San Diego, unless they're actually seriously interested in the house. They want to know the price. The initial calls that you get when you put a for sale sign in the yard, and our existing coaching students will 100% validate this, are the neighbors. So if you get 10 calls into your 800 home hotline uh, sign writer, then you know at least 30 or 40% are going to be neighbors. And if you ask the question, by the way, which house in the neighborhood are you thinking about selling, as your, say, top two or three questions, you will get listing leads because the people are not anticipating you asking them that. So they're not prepared for that question. So even if they have been calling other realtors, they have been calling off other signs, they've been doing their own CMA homework prior to calling out listing agents and whatnot, that in itself um, gives you an advantage. And you asked about something else, going back to the whole lead follow-up thing. Um, You call them back immediately. And when you call them back immediately, see the skeptics out there, right? The people that are more analytical in nature, they're going to be hearing me say that. And they're going to say, well, are people going to be mad when you call them back? Sure, one out of 20. How'd you get my number? Blah, blah, blah. Don't focus on the one out of 20. Focus on the 19. They're going to be impressed that you called them back, especially, guys, the potential sellers. Right. Because those same mm-hmm. sellers have not been having an experience with quick lead follow-up with all the other agents they've been calling. Right. So get in your mind that the, you know, the urgency matters. Can I share another little interesting tidbit with you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, but before you do, and I don't want to take you off that path, but let me just ask you this. And I, again, I hope I don't wreck your train of thought. So you are going to get listing leads. Probably will. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, then go. Go. I'll, I'll remember my question. Okay. Well, so, so um, I coach the number one Mercedes-Benz salesman in the world. Wow. Um, really great guy. Well, but here's, here's a true story. Julie and I were um, sitting in our house, and um, – this is our, okay, so we'll do complete transparency. This was, 
a, our uh, house that's basically, you know, on or near the beach in Laguna Beach. It's a place we keep just for summering, and we go there, you know, two or three months a year. So we're sitting in this place, and I'm thinking, well, we need to get a new Mercedes. And so I see an ad or something. Something spawns my, you know, I send an email to Fletcher Jones Mercedes-Benz in Newport. I get a call back. Now, this is true. I was literally on the computer, Toby, and I was literally, I hit like send. And then probably within a minute or two, ring, ring, the phone rings. Julie answers the phone here in the background, and hello, this is so and so from you know Mercedes Benz dealer. And Julie goes, "Oh, you're probably calling for Tim, <laughs> you know." And so because I love cars, so she gives the phone to me, and sure enough, the guy was calling me back immediately, and I just hit the web form. I had given him brief financial information, where we lived, what our income was, you know, blah blah. He then here's this basic script: we have the car in stock. Um, you're already approved. Would you like us to bring it by your house tonight? And it was like six thirty, seven o'clock at night. Wow. That makes the difference. Now, this guy sold new, more Mercedes-Benz than even Mercedes-Benz sales guys in Germany, right? This guy was phenomenal. Why? He, wasn't, he didn't give the great price necessarily. I didn't even price shop him, if I'm being honest. He didn't give the, anything. He was urgent. He got to the lead first. And that validates every single study ever done about how people go about choosing an agent. Most people, Toby, choose the first, work with the first salesperson that they meet. Yep. I believe it was National Association of Realtors. You know, there's been lots of studies that have been done on this. But in essence, if you, agents, get in front of someone first, yep. um, they will choose you to work with, even if you're not the most experienced, even if you're not the most skilled, even if you're not the number one in this, even if you haven't been in the business forever. People will work with the first person that they meet. Even if they talk to other realtors, after they've talked with you, they'll work with you. So in a way, understanding that is a beautiful thing because then it's very clear in your head that the key, or I'd say one of the keys to being successful in real estate long term is to get to the lead first. You do that, you'll win. I totally agree. I think that stat is 89%. 89% of the people will work with the first agent they meet. And that's why crazy things, you know, little things like, you know, if you're, if you are starting out or, you know, you're that person who makes $29,000 a year and you don't know what to do, you know, if holding an open house, right? I tell, I tell my coaching clients, like, well, here's what I tell them. I say, Hey, go find, look at the new listings, search for the one that you feel is the best value, the best deal, and go to that person and try to hold that house open. And, you know, and, and as people, and you obviously have to promote it, you know, people come through, you're the first point of contact, and bang, you know, you, you have a, a new buyer lead. <clears throat> let, let me go back real quick. This is, this is the last question I want to ask you about that 800 writer thing. So you're going to get leads from that because you have that script. You're going to ask that question. What house are you thinking about selling in the neighborhood? Now, right. so would it make sense then, you know, one of the things that I tell my coaching clients, I go, look, man, if that, if that person wants to overprice their house, don't waste your time with it, but maybe. No, 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 no. I mean, am I being rude? I'm probably being no, rude. No, 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 no. I didn't mean to interrupt fine. you. No, I, I'm sorry. We've had tons of conversations well, we can do. I love this flow, so that's fine. Okay, all right, so listen. But you, wait, wait, hold on, let me finish my question because you're on top of I want everybody to catch up. So the question I was going to ask <laughs> is, somebody has an overpriced house, you know, should you list that house and put your sign in the ground just to have that writer, right, to, to claim that real estate so that you do get that, you know, those phone calls and, and you're able to potentially cap, capture those listing leads? Okay, so here's the reality of it. I mean, you know, if you overprice a listing and you, it's, it's for sale in the first you know, couple weeks, maybe a month that it's for sale, it does start to become stale. I, you know, and the way we, we have tons and tons of different scripts, and I guess another reason that people choose us to be their coaches, Toby, is that we do have scripts, but we don't ask anyone to memorize them. We want you to internalize them and personalize them. In other words, you won't use a script that's not your own words or doesn't flow with how you talk. And, yeah. you know, we have coaching students. We have coaching students in Wasilla, Alaska. You know, we have coaching students in Hawaii. We have coaching students in Canada. We have coaching students in Texas. We have coaching students in New York City. You know, I have a coaching student right now who's working with Bono and um, Jay-Z trying to find a property. And, you know, he, so anyway, the point of it is, is you take a script and then you personalize, you, you know, you internalize it and then you personalize it. So when you're looking at a situation where basically a seller wants to overprice a house, the gist of it is you have to be 100% honest with them, but you have to be very careful in the words you use. So the first question, Toby, and I'll ask you this, mm -hmm. is why does a seller overprice? What's their real reason? And the answer is not because they want more money. Why does a seller overprice a house? 
Uh, look, here's here's what I think. I think that both buyers and sellers do not live in the present, right? So sellers look they 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 still live in 2006 when their house was worth you know 1.2 and now it's worth 800. And buyers also live in the past because they they look at that house and they go, hey, why should I pay 900 for that house? Because in 09 that thing was 650. So for me, that's how I would answer that question: is buyers don't live in the present. Well, I'm not disagreeing or with anything don't. you just said. And everything everything you just said is true. But why does a seller overprice a house, a car? I mean, you've sold stuff before, Toby. I've sold stuff before. When it's my stuff, it's automatically worth more than any sort of logical explanation <laughs> why it wouldn't be worth that. Right. You know, with all the properties, our own properties that Julie and I have sold over the years, we, <laughs> Julie always wants to overprice them. Why? Because it's ego. That's why. Huh. So a seller will overprice a property because of ego, because they want to be right, because it's theirs, so it's automatically better. You, there, there is no logical way, generally speaking, to overcome a seller who's really dug their heels in about overpricing. Really, there isn't. But what you have to do when you run up against one of these sellers, and I'm thinking about your market in San Diego. The market's hot, seller's market. I mean, it's true in a lot of places in the country, but in California where you are, dude, yeah. it is rampant. It's nuts. You run into a seller that's got their head in the clouds about price, yep. and they have to sell. Now, there's a key differentiator. Right. So this is really critical. If they have to sell their house, not want to sell, you know, have to sell is a divorce, a bankruptcy, a forced relocation, something that's almost external that's forcing them to make a decision about selling their house versus, oh, if we can get our price versus, well, if we can find a house that we're interested in versus those types of things. So a truly motivated have to sell seller. And agents listening, go to your, list, your listings you sold this year. And I bet you nine out of 10, not everyone, but nine out of 10 will have been a have to sell not a want to sell. So if you have a have to sell seller and they want overpriced, but you know they have to sell the house, you have to be 100% honest with them. Don't use words like, and this is really critical, don't ever say you're overpriced. Overpriced is fingernails on a chalkboard. Hmm. If you say that to a seller, that is a word that is going to get you rejected, especially if they're coming from a place of ego where they probably are if they're wanting to overprice. There's no logic behind overpricing. Your CMAs, guys, are proving to the seller what it should sell for, and if they still won't listen, you have to understand that seller's coming from ego, not from logic. You can try to beat them over the head with logic all you want, but you're just going to frustrate yourself, and you're going to use words like overpriced. Don't use overpriced. Say things like ahead of the market. You're just a, this is just a little bit ahead of the market. I'm just hmm. giving you guys some old, hopefully, as Howard Brinton used to say, pearls. I'll give you another one. Don't say lower your price. Lower your price, again, for most, yeah, that, that's like, punching the seller in the head and saying, not only are you wrong about price, in other words, making them wrong is an ego thing, your yeah. ego making them wrong about, okay, but you're also in their minds taking money out of their pocket. You want to say, Mr. Seller, we have to reposition the house on the market so that we correctly reflect the buyer's expectations. Oh, <laughs> right? <laughs> right yeah. I mean, all of a sudden they're hearing that and it's not, oh, okay, well, I guess that makes sense, right? So you have to script yourself in such a way that you're going to be receptive to your potential sellers. Um, so if you have a seller, getting back to your original question, that insists on overpricing, you explain to them this, uh, basically combining all these scripts. So Mr. Seller, listen, I appreciate the fact that you want to list the house for, say, 500, even though the market's telling us, not I'm saying, not the CMA saying, the market's telling us it's probably more at the mid fours, but let's do this. And, and remember, guys, this is a have to sell seller, and if you don't list it at the seller's price, you're going to walk away with no listing. And there's an old rule in life called some money is better than no money. But I don't want you to lie to them to buy the listing. Say, I can see how possibly it's worth 500000 depending on the direction of the market over the next two weeks. So let's do this. Um, let's go ahead and list it for you know, four ninety nine. And by the way, guys, you, your CMA could have been wrong. You could have underpriced it. The market could have basically had a sell-off since you did your CMA two weeks ago. Hmm. And it could have actually had a, you know, a lack of supply. And it could be worth what the seller thought. You never know. Anyone who sold real estate has been in that situation before. But let's assume that your CMA is accurate. The seller's genuinely overpriced. Say, listen, um, after two weeks or ten showings, if we don't have an offer on the property, Mr. Seller, Let's agree to reposition it on the market so that we correctly reflect the buyer's expectations. And then you write it on this, it, ideally you write it on the listing contract that on, you know, what you just said, two weeks or 10 showings, then write down the date for two weeks. Um, if we don't have an offer on the property, then we reposition the house on the market by 10%. Now you can, you know, vacillate on that. You can go, like I have coaching clients in uh, Manhattan 
and they're listing properties for $5 million, $6 million. I've got one guy that's chasing a listing right now for $13 million. And I've got another coaching client in uh, California who just listed something for $22 million. This is, you know, really the extremes of things. Well, in those areas, you can have overpriced sellers buy millions of dollars. So you kind of have to adjust the script. Remember, you know, right. you have to internalize and personalize. Right. You have to adjust it for your marketplace. But that's how you do it. So you do take a listing overpriced. But you do be honest that you, of your opinion. Um, otherwise, it's just not something – you won't have a long career unless you approach every seller with what's best for the seller always. Even right. if the seller is being gruff with you, you always have to have what's best for them in mind as your prominent thought. Yeah, I love that. I, 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 and I love those scripts. Um, um, so, yeah, so, I, so that's perfect. So uh, you, you do take that overpriced listing. You, you, you manage their mindset as you go along. You, you know, even, and even though um, – and the other thing, okay, you win because you, win you gain that real estate. You get your sign on the ground. You get that 800 hotline rider on top of it, and, uh, you know, and you're, you're beginning to show some expertise in the, in the, in the neighborhood, right? Because people drive by, they see, they see Tim Harris, and they go, man, that guy Tim is everywhere. Look, <clears throat> let me go back something really quick about your career. Right? You had this very interesting career. You have this first breakout year. 100 plus houses and then you do something and it's it, it's worked for you tim but you know here's what i see agents do and really this is all entrepreneurs right it's that shiny object syndrome they're doing this whatever they're doing they see something that they think will be beneficial to them they, they drop what they're doing they change course and and most of the times that is a recipe for disaster now if i look at your career you, you're massively successful 103 deals your first year then you go on a speaking tour Right. For me, like that bright, shiny object, it's, you know, that's why I started with being deliberate. And then you and then you wrote a book and then you started coaching. Now, you've made that work. But in terms of chasing uh, before I get too long winded with this, tell me sort of just what you, you and Julie were thinking when you did the speaking tour, then write the book and then you kind of transitioned into coaching. Oh, interesting question. And by the way, long-winded is my end of this interview, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. I know. It was about you. No, no, no. No worries. No worries. Uh, you, you're asking basically, if I understand correctly, you're asking what made us go from – well, okay. So if you read that interview um, that NAR did us uh, – did, did of Julie and I, and we were, you know, I don't remember what year it was, 98, I think, 97 okay. maybe. I don't remember, honestly. Back in the 90s, uh, we said in the interview that we basically were thinking that we were going to stay in the industry for, you know, roughly seven to ten years. We didn't have uh, – and I just – I probably didn't really think out that, uh, that – what I said back when we, you know, were making that statement, but it worked out to be that way. And I guess, you know, the reason that we transitioned from one to the other – is because we'd accomplished, honestly, we'd accomplished our goals in the real estate business. That's, that's the honest answer. Got it. When we were selling real estate, you know, after we sort of fell into 100 houses our first year, and I, obviously, guys, it wasn't a fall into, you know, we worked our butts off and a whole lot more. But after we sort of reached a certain plateau of, and again, this is going to be something that's going to make some people uncomfortable, but personal wealth, we sort of were able to see forward as to what we could expect in terms of increases in personal wealth going forward um, in the real estate business, selling real estate in Columbus, Ohio. We had uh, set our business around. Now, guys, understand that our primary focus is when we sold real estate and as coaches is always what's best for the agent. I, I always am connected with that feeling of being a small business owner, of being a mom and pop, which we were literally. Eventually, Julie's parents started working for us, and we hired – fire agents, we had a staff, we had a listing specialist, we've done all of that, we've gone down those paths. But I remember what it felt like, and I'll never lose, never lose contact with that, because when I'm on a coaching call with somebody, and they're trying, and I, without them saying, Toby, I can feel what they're feeling, because I felt those feelings before. Right. Um, so, because of the fact that Julie and I were able to be successful in real estate, we were to accomplish our personal goals, we the coaching thing just sort of happened organically. I think most, you know, honestly, most things in life do work out that way. If you're on the path, it, people call it luck, but what is luck really? It's, you know, luck, lucky opportunity meets, meets preparedness. Right. Um, it turns out we weren't, I mean, I'm sure we got better. I mean, Julie and I have had each probably at this point, a hundred thousand um, one-on-one calls. I mean, quite literally, we've had just tens of thousands of one-on-one calls and we've gotten really good at uh, being real estate coaches. I bet you we're better real estate coaches than we ever were at selling real estate. The reality of it is because we've done this more intensely for a longer period of time. 
It's the passion for helping people that drives us now because we don't have to work for money anymore. The definition of rich is when uh, you know, your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. And I realize some people right now, we're having a money conversation. Tim sounds like he's bragging. I'm not. I'm just, what I'm trying to say to you guys is we're just normal people from Columbus, Ohio, you know, that went to Ohio State University. We figured some things out earlier in life. We've improved those ideas. We've made it into a system. turns out the system works in virtually every market and every price range, and we have unbelievable passion for what happens as a result of coaching. I love the coaching calls. I personally love it. I don't have to do them anymore. And sometimes when the coaching students are, you know, not doing their homework or they're basically starting to be, you know, it, it, whatever, I'll tell them, listen, I don't have to coach you. I'm not, I, I appreciate the honor of being your coach. It's a pleasure to be your coach. But if you're not going to really use this information in our time together, even though you're paying me for that half hour, uh, I am going to, honestly, I'm going to cancel our, and I, I cancel probably two or three a month, truthfully. I mean, if they get to the point, of, but, you know, they get to the point, some of them, where they're making enough money, where they've built enough spokes on their wheels, we call it, where they have, they've accomplished their goals. They don't want to go beyond that. So getting back to your original question, Julie and I did, and we realized that in, our, in, our, in, in the real estate business that we are in, you can't scale a real estate sales practice. You can't. Everybody talks about you can, but you can't. It's not scalable. You can scale other businesses. So obviously what we do now is scalable, not the one-on-one -on -one calls, but some of the other products we sell. And then we've invested in other businesses that, we, that you can scale too. I mean, you know, just in all kinds of different things. And uh, so I hope I'm at, see, I told you, long-winded was my end of the center. Yeah, not yeah, no, no, it's good. Wait, wait, so <laughs> look, Tim, uh, unpack that a little bit. You, you can't scale a real estate business. Look, explain what that means to, for somebody who's going, I, I, what does Tim mean by that? Okay, I'll give you a great example. Okay. Um, we have on a regular basis these agents who come to us, and they're almost, they have big teams. That's one of our biggest groups of agents that are joining us as coaching. You know, they were looking for, um, help with these big teams. There's this ethos out there right now that's totally and completely insidious to the individual agent. Remember, we're an agent-centric coaching business. We're not, we are 100% focused on the individual agent, on their families, on them you know, building financial security, love Dave Ramsey's you know, philosophy on wealth building and paying off debt, all that stuff. That's where our heart and our soul is with the individual agent. So this big team thing is, is not what's best for, I'd say, 8 out of 10 uh, individual agents, and here's why. So I have these agents that will, you know, we start coaching, and they'll have three or four buyer agents. They're buying buyer leads from all these normal sources. You know, they've got listing specialists. They've got this, da 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 Now let's say they're making 2 or $3 million a year in gross commission. So them and all their minions are making 2 or $3 million a year. They originally formed this team for non-business reasons. They didn't form this team with the idea of creating wealth. They believed that more units would create more net, which would then hopefully maybe you know, create more personal wealth for them, but it doesn't work out like that. Let's use a million dollars as an example. If an agent and their team has a gross commission of a million dollars, their net to them, the rainmaker, the person taking all the risk, the person that's you know, you know, basically managing the whole thing, keeping it alive, dealing with all the adult daycare things that are necessary when you have, you know, a bunch of individuals working for you, salespeople, you know, a lot of drama. Their net is probably going to be 18 to 20% of that million dollars. That's a real number. Agents right now who don't track their numbers, who, uh, you know, are forming these big teams, I promise you they're going to be offended by what I just said. So before you send Toby emails or me emails, do your own homework. I'll tell you somebody who is really honest about it. Listen to the interview that I did with Pat Hyben. He had one of the biggest teams back in, I don't know how long ago it was, was I mean, 08, 09, I think. And they were doing like $6 million a year in commission. And I was having this conversation with Pat during this interview I did with him. And he, I said, you know, it's been my experience, 18 to 20%. They, then he didn't say anything for a second. He goes, you know, he goes, yeah, that's about right. I mean, our, my peak years, I was netting around a million dollars a year. Well, here's my premise. Most agents are going to be uh, able to accomplish all their financial goals, have a wonderful life, pay off their debts, uh, and they're going to be able to do it with maybe themselves and maybe two assistants. How? Because if your goal, let's say, for example, is to make $300,000 a year to you before taxes, 
and let's say, you know, let's even call it after, um, after expense. So you're making $25,000 a month on average, or, you know, scale it down. You want to make $10,000 a month average. If you have a team, you have to do, do the math on this, guys. If you want to make $10,000 a month, net to you, and you have a team, you're going to have to do probably 50 or 60,000 a month in gross revenue. If you have a million dollars in revenue, you're going to make 180 to 200,000 dollars before taxes. The math varies, right? You might be able to run a more profitable business, but it, most of the agents I ever talk to, they're not, because they're buying leads, which is totally insidious. This trend, Toby, that's been going on since really '07 of buying buyer leads is insane. Don't ever buy buyer leads. Why? It's simple, because you can generate tons of buyer leads when you learn how to be a listing agent. Learn how to be a listing agent. Do the simple idea Toby and I discussed earlier, 800 Home Hotline, or just really there's a number of other basically free things, and you'll have to beat the buyers off the stick. You don't ever buy buyer leads. If you're buying buyer leads, you need to really question the long-term viability of that because of the fact that buying buyer leads has become, not is becoming or will become, oversaturated. The quality of the buyer leads is going down. The price is going up. More people want to buy the buyer leads. The buyer leads are getting more diluted. It's not a sustainable business model. Learn how to be a listing agent. And if you want to you know, have the most net and have the least amount of hassle, if you're a listing agent and you have one or two assistants to basically do the running around for you, that's the ideal situation. That's what's best for most agents. So, I mean, here's, here's a fun question, Toby. Why is it that this whole idea of a mega team is being pressed upon agents? What's the real agenda behind that line of thinking? If we can agree that it's not what's best for the individual agent, why is that being pressed upon agents? Do you have an opinion? Um, I have an opinion, but my opinion, uh, we talked about this, so I don't want to steal your thunder. So, and you have an interesting take on it, so share it with, with everybody. Well, it's con- it, and, and my, the hardest thing... Uh, and when you own a real estate brokerage, the crappiest job is being the team leader, or being the office manager, being the person that has to go out there and recruit agents. And there's this uh, model that's been around forever in the real estate brokerage business called body shops. 99% of all real estate brokerages are body shops, meaning that they are just burning through agents. Most agents will get in the business, they'll be able to sell to their Aunt Molly, and they'll sell to their brother-in-law, and they'll be able to sell to a handful of their immediate centers of influence and past clients for the first 12 to 24 months. Then after that, because they have never learned real sales skills, because they don't know how to lead generate on their own, because, 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 they will not necessarily leave the industry, but they won't really be active in the industry anymore. So in other words, their career is effectively over. It's called real estate body shops. Those types of agents are the most profitable for real estate brokerages. Those types of agents are, you know, the ones that you can get the most commission split on. So when I see these average normal agents these people that want to have great lives to their families, want to you know, take great care of their responsibilities, they want to spoil their kids at Christmas, they want to not have real estate night sweats, as my wife likes to call it, of worrying about money. When I see those people being told that you are a failure unless you have a team, which is in essence the message that's being sent out there, it literally makes my teeth itch because it is a lie. The whole team ethos thing is being pressed upon agents right now because the brokers are trying to uh, push on the agents to do the hardest, crappiest job. If I am a real estate broker and I have 50 agents, and they're all individual practitioners, they don't have teams, and I say to them and I sell them and I get them to believe that everything happens when you have a team, what have I just done? I've gotten 50 individual agents now to go out there and start recruiting agents, adding agents to my brokerage. I've just essentially for free delegated the crappiest job in my real estate brokerage, which is, me, which is you know, hiring and finding agents right. to all my agents. Right. How yeah. is that what's best for you guys if you do the math on this? That's yeah. the whole yeah. – totally. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. And look, I was talking to a different broker and we about this issue, and he said – and this guy, this guy had you – know, it was a big brokerage. And he said all new agents are good for at least you know, about two to three transactions. So you, know, you bring somebody yep. on, they're good for that two to three transactions in the first 12 months, and then you, know, and then you go out and recruit again. So let me, let me back up for a second. So, so buying buyer's leads, right? You said quality is going down, price is going up, which I would agree with that. Um, and uh, you shouldn't do that. Now, it, you and Julie, you know, you've, you've done 100,000 calls. Uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of calls. That's a lot of time being yeah, on the it, phone. Toby, in all actuality, it's way more than that. It's way more than that. But I'm just saying our personal 
one-on-one. -on -one. You're stuck with Julie or I on the phone for a half hour, and we're your coach. Easily 100000 each. Easily. Right, right. So, so you work with, again, like this Mercedes guy, right? The, the most successful uh, sales guy in the world. And you also work with people who are just starting out. And I, I want to know from you, you know, you've seen all this stuff. What what kind of problems does the the top producers have versus the problems that the you know the guy who sells six houses a year have? What 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 are the difference between those two types of problems? That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that we always try to impress upon people, no matter where they are in their careers, no matter what industry they're in, because we also I mean a majority like ninety nine percent of our overall coaching students are obviously real estate agents. Um, is I ask this question, and this is a real eye-opener, and Toby, you and I have had this off radio, so I mean, I'll play it both ways. If, you, if I were to ask all your listeners, what is your product, right? You know, a pie shop makes pies, a dry cleaner makes you know, clean clothes, let's say, a, a, an auto mechanic makes working cars, but ultimately, you guys aren't really delivering a tangible product. It's intangible. You're just getting in the middle. You're essentially, essentially let's say, if you're doing your job correctly, bringing a buyer and a seller together and you're doing it in such a way to make the process go smoothly for it's less stress for everyone so both sides can accomplish their goals. Let's just say theoretically that's your primary focus. Okay. I ask you the question, what is your product? What is it that you make? The agents will typically answer, none of these answers are wrong, but they'll say, my product is happy clients, my product is sold listings, my product is all these types of things that are all right, but they're not the bottom line if you truly are in this business to make money, which by the way, all of you should be because you are entrepreneurs. You do work for yourself. Your product is profit. Your product is profit. Your product is the profit you get from the services you provide. If you don't have enough profit in your business, uh, again, this will make some people uncomfortable, but it's because you have yet to learn how to service people at a high enough level that they're willing to use you to perform the real estate transaction. If you don't have the financial security, if you have not gone to the places in the world, if you don't have the things that you want in life, and all these things, you know, if, assuming you're comfortable with the idea that you like stuff, and, you know, we're spiritual beings and physical manifestations, and we need stuff. We need houses. We need shoes on our feet. We need cars to drive. It might as well be nice stuff. Can we all agree to that? Sure. Yeah. So if, if, you're in that, if you're in that situation where you don't have what you want in life, it's because the simple fact is, is you have yet to, fit, you have yet to learn or accept, or maybe in many cases no one's told you, that the key to long-term financial success is learning how to provide a service that hundreds if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and maybe even billions of people are willing to pay for. You can do that in your real estate business. You can do that in your individual. You have to do that through providing superior service. You always have to have the best interest of the client at heart. I mean, it's God's work in a way. Okay, now I know some of the people are going to go, oh my God, Tim's on a tangent. Maybe I am. <laughs> but the reality of it is, is that we, when we help somebody with a stressful event, and buying or selling real estate is a very stressful event, we are doing God's work. We are. You know, it's a very stressful event, and if we can make that experience something pleasurable, something that doesn't uh, hurt their family or doesn't cause them stress, that is something that is an honor to provide for folks, right? Yeah. That's the mindset. Yeah. So product, the, the product is the profit. You don't get rich selling real estate. That's another myth. Well, I'll just sell a thousand houses and I'll get rich. That's not true. You get rich from the profit you make from selling real estate. So you ask me the question, say the newer agent, the more experienced agent. Yeah. The first thing I have to clean out of their heads is why you're in the business and you're in the business to make profit. And the next thing I focus them in on, and this is really true with the top producers, again, because this whole team thing, you know, and they're buying buyer leads, and they're doing all these other things, trying to create more units. Don't focus on units. Focus on money. Business people do not focus on units, guys. They focus on money. The reason that all of us, present company included, were taught to focus on units is because the brokers back in olden town, you know, they didn't want their agents realizing how crappy their commission split was, so opposed to focusing on dollars, they've got to focus on units. Focus on dollars because whatever you focus on is what you'll manifest. So if you focus on the commissions that you're making, some people are really uncomfortable with that, but you won't be uncomfortable with that if you realize it's the profit you make from the transactions that leads to the life that you really want, that leads to the ability for you to you know, provide for your family, provide for your church, your synagogue, your mosque, your temple, provide for your local community because you've learned how to provide a superior service 
that so many people are willing to embrace. I love that. And and c- could you briefly unpack what that superior – people say, yeah, yeah, look, Tim, I, I understand that I need to provide superior service, but you know what they think is superior service may not be superior service. What what are some guidelines? What How would you package that? What does that look like, superior service? Well, let, I'll make that into a very – I love that question. It's a great question. Um, so here's the mindset. You have to call – an expired seller right now or for sale by owner. And by the way, don't call them for sale by owners. Call them unrepresented sellers because that's really what they are. So if you have to call an expired or FISBO. Now, most agents, especially ones we're coaching, are going to be, no problem, I'll call them right now. But let's say you've never done it before and you're nervous about it and you have all these thoughts running in your head. What are they going to say? How am I going to overcome this? How is this going to be handled? Where are all the, I mean, guys, just literally put yourself in a mind right now, mindset right now, that Toby and I are going to force all of you to pick up the phone and call FISBO and you've never done it before. If you're a regular over the phone, you know, if you regular, you know, working over the phone, doing over the phone work, it's one of the really about 50 spokes when a spoke is a lead generation idea that we'll teach you depending on what your particular goals are. How do you feel anticipation of making that phone call? Do you feel all those fears? Do you feel all those thoughts? You, what am I going to say? How am I going to overcome this? What if they're mean? What if they're right? All your mind fills with all these things that are going to prevent you from actually getting the outcome. Now, if you still force yourself to make that phone call, but those thoughts are still rushing around in your mind, your dominant thought's going to be, I need to get the hell off this phone as fast as possible before these people figure out I don't know what I'm doing or beca- before they hurt my feelings because they're going to be mean. I mean, these are the types of subconscious sort of self-limiting things that can manifest. All right, now, I want to share with you a different mindset to answer and by, the, and, and by the way, they do. I, I've had that. I've, I've done that exact thing. Like, you know, uh, talk very quickly to, to get to the node just so I can hang up, man. And then I go, oh, I did it. Um, so, so that is, right. that's a real, that's, I'm sure you have felt that too. Um, well, I suppose. So, <laughs> you know, the idea of making, well, I don't remember feeling that way, Got honestly. But I'll agree with you. Okay. I've just, you know, since, since it's your radio show, but I'll agree <laughs> with you. So, so we're, all right, so here's the mindset instead. And I remember the first time that I figured out as a coach how to help. I had this, I'll even say his name. What the hell? If he's listening, great. This great coaching student named Jeff Silva. Beautiful guy, wonderful family, you know, just wonderful, great coaching client. He was, he had ever he would be somebody that you'd list your house with even if you had a, your real estate license, okay? I mean, that good of a person coming and going. He was nervous about picking up the phone, and he wouldn't do it. And in his marketplace at the time, now this was a while ago, there were a ton of expires, and he didn't have, you know, he didn't have the mindset or the cash flow to really be buying, you know, so he wanted to learn the skills necessary. Hats off to him. He was nervous about making the calls. After, I don't know how long, I got him to make the calls, but he wasn't getting results. And I walked him through. Let's close your eyes. Let's pretend you're picking up the phone. You're going to make a phone call. You know, tell me all the thoughts you're filling in your head right now. And I had him all, write them all down. And it was not too many, 20 different thoughts, all of them negative. I said, okay, now I want you to rip that piece of paper up and put it on the side. Now I want you to write on your piece of paper, um, how, can I be, how can I help you? How can I be of service to you? In other words, shift your mindset away from all those negative thoughts that were on that other piece of paper and refocus your mind on truly being of service. Being of service to others is our highest calling. Being of service to others, truly helping other people, is our highest calling as humans. That is my real belief. So I had him write, Jeff wrote down a piece of paper, how can I be of service to you? And then I asked him, go through that mindset game again. You're picking up the phone. Your dominant thought is how to be of service to you. And then we kind of took a respite, and I said, How, you know, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? He said, it completely shifted. Because the thoughts, and here's why, because the how can I be of service to you unplugs that fear-based ego response of self-protectionism, which results in us maybe making the contact but not getting the result. And it refocuses on truly being of service. That is where the secret sauce lies when it, you're t- making these phone calls, when you're making contacts, when you're doing lead follow-up, when you're living life, if you have an approach of how can I be of service to you, how can I help that person, hopefully you guys feel on this interview that's where I'm coming from because that's what I feel. How can I help you? I know there's skeptics out there. I know there's people that are listening and they're saying whatever they're saying in their heads, but understand where I'm coming from is I want to help you as an individual practitioner 
get better at your job because, so more people do business with you so you can have a brilliant life. And you know, whatever your bucket list items, you completely, totally do all the, not just your bucket list items, but the people you care, the people you care about love because the real estate industry is an amazing thing. Jeff made the calls after that with that dominant mindset of how can I be of service. And then it was probably within a month, he became in a killer appointment setter and he was already good at taking listings. So that basically was the missing link. And, um, you know, I'm sure to this day it's extremely successful. So that same mindset I'm sharing with all of you listening now and uh, try it. Instead of thinking about what are they going to think about me when I ask for business? What are they going to think about me if I do quick lead follow up? What are they going to, how am I going to feel if someone, you know, I don't want to seem too pushy. All those types of thoughts, replace those with my existence in this industry is to be of service to others to help other people. You do that, everything changes, but it changes with your mindset. Then all of a sudden the skills and the scripts and the listing presentations and your pre-listing pack, all of them make sense because you know you're there truly to help people. Yeah, and you get paid in some cases a crazy amount of money for doing it. That good job for you to, for choosing a great industry. Right, there you go. I mean, look, so, so you manage that mindset and couple it with the idea that your product is profit, right? And you focus right. on that money. You're focusing on two things. And, and I think a lot of people think, you know, focusing on money and then focusing on great service are at odds with one another. Uh, but, but they, I know, but, but that's false thinking. I agree. No, I, That's like, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, I mean, that's why I brought it up because it is false. And, and, you know, and we have to start wrapping up. But so one of the things that I love is what you say and, you know, talk about mindset, talk about, you know, think about money, focus on that. And that is your product and it will manifest itself. I believe that. And I, and I think uh, a, a lot of people think that's just too woohoo and it doesn't happen. I, I believe it. I'm sure you believe it as well. Um, <clears throat> so listen, we are going long here. Uh, is there this? I'm going to ask you a question. I don't ask many people, but I know you have a ton of you stuff. You should do a two part. This we, merits a two-part interview. We should. We should. Um, uh, do you want to do that? Do you want to go long? Let's do it now. Keep, let's keep going unless you have another appointment. Okay. No, I don't. Um, okay. So uh, so this is part one. We're going to wrap up and uh, tune in and on the next episode, and we're going to – you're going to hear roll Tim. Back yeah, roll back in. Okay. Let's go. Yeah. Luck. 20% skill, 15% concentrated power.